Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to Reporters, our look at the very best from France 24 from around the world. This edition takes us back to two days before the 11th of September 2001 and the Panjshir Valley of Afghanistan and another fateful event. Commander Ahmed Shah Massoud, a warlord renowned for his fight against the Soviets, was killed. He was a man with a reputation not just as a leader in war, but with a view for Afghanistan way ahead of its time. Masu was murdered by men who got to him by posing as TV journalists. The killing bore the hallmarks of an Al-Qaeda operation. Well, now, ten years later, our correspondent Olivier Julie went back to the Panjshir Valley to find out what is the lasting influence of Commander Masoud. Here's Olivier Julie's report. Still visible in the river, the remains of a few Soviet tanks and armoured vehicles. They represent the last remaining traces of the Great War fought between Afghans and Soviets in the Panjshir province in the 1980s. At the time, Yusuf was barely 20. He worked as the official cameraman for Commander Ahmed Shah Massoud, filming every battle fought by the Mujahideen. This morning, joined by a political scientist he knows, he's taking advantage of the good light to take a few pictures. We can take a photo here too. There are three tanks, one here, one here, and the other there. These three, they should be taken out. Yusuf will send the photos to an architect in Paris. After several months of wrangling with the provincial government, he's obtained authorization to display the remains of the tanks here, beside the river. While they were working on the road, they dumped some of the tanks into the river and sunk others into the roadbed. This is my land, and I've decided to create a memorial here for the martyrs of the war against the Soviet Union. We want to preserve the tanks that got left here in order to tell future generations about Afghanistan's history. More than 1,200,000 Afghans died during the 10-year conflict. A further 6 million were forced from their homes. All around the world, every country erects memorials to mark their wars. Here they just threw away the tanks in the river to get rid of them. It's an attempt to hold onto a memory before the river washes history away for good. Today, it's hard to believe these mountains once dripped with blood. We're in northern Afghanistan, and beyond this military checkpoint, the Panjshir River snakes its way through 360 kilometers of mountain terrain, the mountains of Hindu Kush. This is the land where the celebrated Tajik commander Massoud triumphed. These mountains and his face have become legendary. A little further along the valley, we have a meeting with Abdullah. A former soldier turned businessman, he wants to tell us about the military tactics that were used. One of the village youngsters, Bashir, is full of questions. How long did the battle go on for? In this valley, the battles went on for five years. They were very intense. And during those five years, the Russian soldiers and the Mujahideen fought hand to hand. There weren't any ordinary residents left in the valley. It was too dangerous. The Mujahideen used the cover of night and their knowledge of the terrain to lay anti-tank mines. This was one of Massoud's key strategies against the Soviets' firepower. We laid plenty of mines, and we used rockets too. If it had been a conventional war, it would have been much harder to beat the tanks. But against the Mujahideen, the Russian tanks were little use, because Massoud used guerrilla techniques. According to Abdullah, he made detailed sketches and even small models, preparing every maneuver with the same passion. When we lost Massoud, we were in despair. He'd always falls alongside us. He wasn't the kind of leader to give orders from far away in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or any other country, like some others did. He was with us, he guided us, like a father. We felt like we'd been orphaned. Commander Massoud's body is buried not far from here, at the summit of Martyrs Hill. 180 men are currently working on expanding the mausoleum. Eniat is the man in charge of the site. You see here, the plastic should fill the whole space and it mustn't move. You see there's a gap. It shouldn't be there. You have to find a solution. Change the stone, use another. The next time I won't be so forgiving. 
Finish. Hello. It's taken six years to get enough money together to carry out the work, and it's far from complete, even if Eniat tries to persuade us otherwise. This is the entrance to the mausoleum, and this section is for the fountains. 70% of the work is done. We're putting in the lighting now, and it'll soon be ready. One month from now, these two sections will be completed. Soon there will be a visitor centre facing Masood's tomb, ready to welcome the crowds expected to come and mark each anniversary of his death. Inside, Abid has just arrived from Kabul. He remembers how two fake journalists came and killed the commander. I think so that maybe the, the something put it in the camera. I'm feeling bad because, you know, we lose the, the big man in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda and the Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack. For them, Ahmed Shah Massoud had become their biggest enemy in Afghanistan. To get a better idea of what actually happened, we head to Kabul, where Yusuf meets Kanishka, a Franco-Afghan political scientist. Here we see Masood and his men facing off against the troops commanded by Dr. Najibullah, who was the Soviet-backed president of Afghanistan. It's 1992 and in a few weeks Kabul will fall to Masood and his men. Wow, was that a rocket? Yes, it was a rocket. The enemy was firing on us. They wanted us to hit the soldiers in the front, but it passed right by them and me. I came to see Masood to join one of his groups of fighters, but he told me I was too young to fight and that he had enough soldiers. He asked me to join his cameraman and to train. From that day on, I was Masood's cameraman. Commander Masood used these videos to train his recruits. Today, the 5,000 hours of archives shot by Youssef allow Kanishka to get a deeper insight into one of the darkest periods of Afghan history and one about which the least is known. In 1992, Masood became defense minister and sent Afghan warlords to Kabul. They would spend the next four years killing each other in a capital city turned ghost town. A question about the responsibility of the leaders has been raised, but Commander Massoud wasn't necessarily a politician. He was a military leader who was unanimously and universally respected, that's a fact. But was he a political leader with the ability to start or stop something happening in this country in 1992 and afterwards until the Taliban arrived? That's something that should be explored through these archives to find out what was the extent of his responsibilities and power. At this point, the vast majority of the Afghan population still saw the Taliban as their only chance of peace. Mullah Omar entered a ruined Kabul in 1996. Street thieves were outlawed, schools for girls closed, and Massoud and his soldiers turned back towards the north to Panjshir. We track down one of his bodyguards. Nowadays, he exports precious stones in bulk. So you've swapped your military uniform for a businessman suit? The Americans and the Europeans came and took over our security. Now they're the ones in military fatigues and we can get on with our lives and dress as businessmen. <laughs> Ten years have passed since Commander Massoud's death and the Taliban are a bigger threat than ever in Afghanistan. I was with Massoud in the car. We were getting back to northern Panjshir. We were talking about Afghanistan and he wasn't very optimistic. He explained that while Pakistan supported the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, nothing would change. He was convinced that Afghanistan would only be able to achieve peace again and move on when Pakistan cut off its support to the Taliban. So Massoud once again found refuge in Panjshir. The mountains would protect him from his enemies and, as a bonus, provide him with a veritable war chest. 
Mohammed Gul's stones come from here, at the top of this peak. Police are all around and with good reason. We're just 50 kilometers or so from the border with Nuristan, a province openly governed by the Taliban. As soon as day breaks, children from around the valley throng the slopes of the mine. We're looking for emeralds. If you do this, they appear on the surface. When they're mixed with the sand, you can't see them. So that's why we're doing this. Afterwards, you shake it up. And if there are emeralds, they'll shine out at you. This one is worth a little under $20. Pantier emeralds are very high quality. They're superior to the ones in other regions and other countries. Barman province has stones, so does Brazil and Pakistan, but they're of lower quality. These mines are an important resource for the people living around here. They were also an important resource for the Panjshir war effort. Masood used to sell these stones and sell them abroad. He used the money to finance the Mujahideen. Even if foreigners got the best of the bargain, it benefited the fighters too. The rest of the fighting funds came from families in the valley. This is Bukharak. The Mujahideen recognize each other by their headgear. A wad of soft fabric that Masood brought back from Pakistan. It has become their emblem. He said that for praying in the mosque, it was easier to put on and take off than a turban. And you know what else? It looks good. It's an honor to wear the pakul. When we wear it, people know that we'll never sell ourselves out to the infidels. Ahmed Shah Massoud said that we Muslims had no desire to be ruled by foreigners, neither from the east nor the west. In 2001, Massoud the Tajik became Massoud the Afghan when President Hamid Karzai endorsed him as a national hero. In Kabul, his portrait sprang up all over, while a monument was built in his honor. These policemen guard it, while Saeed is responsible for its upkeep. As long as I live, I look after this monument. I was one of his group commanders. Ever since the Soviets came, I was at his side for every battle. I've been looking after this place for five years. I do it because Masood was God's servant and because he wanted peace in Afghanistan. Peace, however, is still a far distant dream here. In spite of large-scale international military deployments, the country is still struggling to resist continuing Taliban attacks. Well, we can now speak to the uh, man behind that report, uh, Olivier Julie. He joins us now uh, by satellite. Um, Olivier, we saw in your report a certain nostalgia uh, for the uh, commander uh, Massoud. Um, on the, the political scale in Afghanistan, um, who are his uh, inheritors, if you like? And what kind of political weight do they have? Yes, so there is a lot of nostalgia. Why? Because there's a great discrepancy between what used to be the uh, alliance in the north and their reputation as a hero and what it has become of it today through uh, the uh, commander. What is left behind and uh, those involved in politics, for example, so one of the major commanders in close, Abdullah Abdullah, who is perhaps uh, the most uh, politicized person at the time, is today uh, head of the opposition. He's well uh, respected but has very little impact on national politics. Two other uh, commanders, uh, Saleh and uh, Sayaf, who uh, have absolutely no political responsibility in the country. And the Mujahideen's reputation today is unfortunately tarnished by Fahim's reputation, who is on the side of Masoud for quite a number of years, who is vice pres president of Ahmed Karzai, but uh, was involved in uh, corruption and uh, in Afghanistan. That's the reason why Panjshiris are rather on the side of Abdullah Abdullah today rather than on Fahim's side who's actually advocating a government that's not well reputed here in the Panjshir region. So very little political influence in national and regional realms. Uh, uh, well, for the uh, future withdrawal of American troops and future Afghanistan. The killing happened, of course, just two days before the fateful events of 9-11 back in 2001. Has a link been established between these two things? 
There has undoubtedly been a link between those two events for, for two different reasons. We learned after 9-11 that uh, Al-Qaeda had a strategy, uh, in, in other words, going to Central Asia, and for that purpose they needed to unblock an anti-Taliban and anti-Qaeda deadlock, which was Panjshir, and to eliminate that de de gridlock, they had to get rid of the leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud, to ease uh, the uh, entrance into the Panjshir region and then have reach or reach out to Central Asia. This was one of the plans of Al-Qaeda at the time. The second link is also directly related to 9-11 and the 9-11 attacks. Uh, the, uh, the masterminds uh, uh, behind 9-11 had, uh, of course, anticipated American retaliation, which was going to be given or getting the support of Ahmad uh, Massoud, uh, the uh, Afghan uh, leader who is most familiar with Al-Qaeda, or Taliban, I'm sorry, who fought them for five years and was uh, well placed to really help and shoulder Americans. Without Massoud, Americans actually financed Advanced, uh, the Northern Alliance, and in just a few weeks, uh, they could have actually gotten rid of the Taliban. Olivia, there's a tendency uh, in the West to uh, almost uh, sanctify uh, the memory of Massoud as someone who, uh, in many ways, embodied uh, a sort of secular Afghanistan, an Afghanistan that gave rights to women, and an Afghanistan that was open to the West. Is this true, or is this a caricature? No, no, this is actually a certainty. This is a truth. Well, in uh, the West, we like to create myths and symbols. Massoud was undoubtedly more open than others, a military commander, an incredible commander. However, he was an Islamist. Uh, he had uh, participated in Islamist movements. We talked about his openness and his uh, awareness uh, and openness to um, uh, female rights, but uh, we never saw his wife uh, uh, present. Uh, he was an Islamist uh, war uh, lord, uh, criticized today. Why? Because he took part between 1992 and 1996. When Kabul was taken over, he participated in the political uh, charter that actually uh, gave rise to chaos when the Mujahideen got to Kabul. Uh, uh, we talked about raids, tortures, massacres uh, between different ethnic groups, even within the Mujahideen. And today, this is really the stake of uh, the Kineshta re research in the report. We try to know the truth and uh, the political uh, responsibility of Masoud. Did he have enough wiggle room? And now that's quite important to know because this chaotic situation in Afghanistan created a breeding ground for the arrival of Afghans. Olivier, thank you very much indeed. Olivier Julie there with uh, his uh, report about uh, the 10th anniversary of the death, uh, the killing of a Commander Masoud in Afghanistan. You can catch it again via francefancat.com. Thank you for watching. Stay with us here on France Fancat.